Block 1. Audiobook title. Mix Audiobook Collection 149. Epic of Ice Dragon. Reborn as an Ice Dragon with a System. Chapter 1381 Vulcan. The Warrior King. Graw. S-H-A-A-A-H. G-R-A-A-A-H. Frost, Kuro, and Kumo attacked a huge fire giant man wearing a black armor and holding a gigantic black and red sword. The three powerful divine beasts had been devastating the army of the Flame Emperor. Until he arrived, and single-handedly held back all three of Drake's strongest divine beasts with a few swings of his great sword. Their bodies were already covered in many wounds, which were not regenerating back at all. Grey flames gently burning their wounds and bodies, their energies were slowly being drained away, their strength lowering exponentially. And this huge man responsible for that was simply standing there, without saying another word. His stoic and manly face showed a huge scar in the middle of it, his eyes glared with red light. He was the Flame Emperor's strongest hound, Vulcan, the Warrior King. A man that almost any fire giant would easily recognize, a man of legends, that had made many spread stories about his battle-driven journey. His story said he was born on a small village of swordsmen, that was destroyed by divine beasts. As the sole survivor, he alone carries the legacy and sword techniques of his tribe. He wandered across the continent of Muspelheim, utilizing the techniques his father taught him, and with wits alone, he slain countless beasts. Slowly growing stronger one step at a time as he saved the lives of many others on the way, he was quickly known as the Blazing Swordsman, and later on, the Sword King. However, after his legend was spread far and wide, he disappeared, leaving behind countless of people awaiting his return to the many villages he had once visited. Someone that was believed to be a hero by many, was working for the Flame Emperor. Roa. Frost desperately leaped towards him, swinging his two gigantic claws while unleashing a wave of slashing shadows and hundreds of icicle spears. Slash. B O O O M. However, with a single swing of his massive sword, Vulcan sliced through all darkness and frost, a wave of red and grey flames hit Frost's face, throwing the divine beast away. Awoo. The huge wolf groaned in agony as his face burned by flames that drained away his life and mana. Vulcan remained in silence, slowly walking towards the wolf. You're the first beast I've ever met capable of taking such an attack to the face and survive. He said, pointing his sword at the struggling wolf. I commend your efforts. I will give you a swift death by my sword. Preparing a powerful attack using his gigantic blade, Vulcan jumped into midair and descended towards the young Fenris neck, aiming to cleanly slice it down. Slash. Crash. However, what intercepted his attack was a huge black and red hammer that flew towards his direction, giving enough time for Frost to run away from the impact rejoining the other two divine beasts. Hugin and Munin descended from the skies in that moment, conjuring healing magic to keep the three alive, for now. A hammer. Vulcan was forced to move back, hitting the floor as he glanced at the tall, muscular, and manly figure that had fired that huge divine hammer towards him. A white-bearded ice giant man wearing silver armor made out of Drake's scales, which quickly called back the hammer he was wielding into his hand. His eyes glowed with the bright red light, his aura emanating the power of not just a mere ice giant, a dark scarlet colored aura surged from within his muscular frame. You. Vulcan's eyes were locked on the man. The beasts did well in holding back a monster like you. The ice giant said, his hammer beginning to overflow with his powerful flames. But now, I'll be your opponent. Don't forget about me, Rakasha. Flash. A young woman appeared behind Rakasha with long wine red colored hair and glowing red eyes. Pale white skin, as pale as candles, wearing a white blouse, tight black leather pants, and red heels, her body quickly was quickly encompassed by her powerful divine blood aura, materializing into a crimson red armor around her beautiful body. Ruby, I told you to stay behind, he's dangerous. Said Rakasha. Mother's already taking care of that area of the battlefield with the rest of our vampire soldiers. Ruby said. Let me help you out a bit, at the very least, uncle. After all, I'm stronger than you. Flash. Vulcan didn't even wait for them to finish their words, instantly rushing towards the two vampires while imbuing his giant sword with his divine flames, 
swinging it several times against the two at once. Comma demonic infernal blade descent. Clash. 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 Crash. Upper swings, left facing slashes, vertical strikes, and explosive impacts, all came together as Vulcan unleashed a barrage of incredibly fast swordsmanship techniques at once. Changing his stance with every attack, generating a wondrous combo that could not be easily stopped. Comma Scarlet Blood Sword Rain. However, Ruby wasn't someone that would budge against mere swordsmanship arts. Her divinity, inherited from the very venerable of blood after he had failed to take over her body, erupted as hundreds of blades made of blood were directed at Vulcan at the same time. Crash. 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 Ung. Vulcan budged, stepping back as he charged his sword with divine power and swung it vertically, a wave of all destroying flames emerged. Comma Infernal Wave. Slash. The wave of flames was intercepted by Rakesha as he stepped forward, his entire body exuding an aura of blood and flames, the combination of his vampire powers and his own divinity as a blacksmith. Comma Scarlet Hammer Smite. Crash. As he swung his hammer, Rakesha's auras converged together, forming a gigantic hammer made of blood flames, hitting back Vulcan's infernal wave, and completely destroying it before it could reach him or Ruby. Not bad. Vulcan smiled at the challenge. It is rare to see vampires in these lands, even rarer to find some that are not affected by our intense sunlight and our blazing landscape. How is it possible that you can even fight so well? Do we need to answer that question? Ruby asked, appearing right behind Vulcan. Ha! Huh. Vulcan was taken aback. Comma I didn't even sense to her move at all, Vulcan thought, his eyes opening in surprise. Comma Crimson Blood Star. Chapter 1382 The Might of the Vampire Venerable's Successor. Walker of the Worlds. Chapter 1740 Explosive Collision. The collision of the two great forces exuded a great pressure on every side. Strong energy fluctuations spread everywhere, along with the heat from the comet-like arrow. Still, the giant slash was actually able to hold the arrow back, preventing it from progressing anymore. The collision only lasted for a second, yet that one second looked very slow. Boom. The explosion knocked up large dust clouds that covered everything along with smoke that clouded everyone's vision. And with the intense immortal key waves mixed in all this, people couldn't even use their immortal sense to observe everything. If they did try that, their immortal sense would simply be pushed back. Only those that had highly refined their immortal sense or those with a high cultivation base would be able to withstand it. But even then, it would take them some time to observe everything. This created the perfect opportunity for Lin Mu to act. Let's get Ting back. Lin Mu directly used Blink and got close to Ting. Next he placed her into his ring before quickly retreating. The entire set of events didn't take more than a couple of seconds, which were already enough for Lin Mu to be in safety. Whoosh. And five seconds later, the fourth tribulation stage immortal man swung his sword again, dispelling the clouds of dust and smoke. What? But when he saw the area in front of him, he was surprised. The wolf disappeared even the third tribulation stage immortal woman was surprised. I didn't sense anything, no one approached. She muttered in confusion. And while they were trying to figure this out, Lin Mu had already retreated a kilometer away and regrouped with Ming Dandan and Ming Aeolian. Brother Mu Lin. Ming Aeolian called out in an anxious tone. I've brought Ting. Lin Mu quickly said to assuage her concern. Thud. The frozen figure out Ting was placed on the ground. Originally Lin Mu had hoped to melt her out using the arrow, but the attack of the fourth tribulation stage immortal man changed that idea. He knew it was not a viable option as the attack would be blocked. But it still gave him another opportunity to rescue Ting. The mix of immortal key and vision blocking from the explosion was enough for Lin Mu to use his ring skill. Even the audience would be unable to see anything when such a thing was happening. Not to mention, his speed of teleportation was very fast and even if someone found it suspicious, there were many excuses that could be given. Is Ting fine Ming Dandan asked with worry. She's fine. Ming Aeolian said after checking her connection with Ting. While the beast was frozen solid, she was simply trapped. An immortal beast was not that easy to freeze just like that. 
Their vitality could keep them alive like this for months even when frozen. Not to mention, the silk that the third tribulation stage immortal woman had used wasn't strong enough to kill her outright. It was merely a restrictive skill. Let me get her out. Lin Mu placed his hand on the ice before a scorching fire ignited on his hand. It quickly started melting the ice while cracks spread across it. Shatter. And a couple of seconds later, the ice shattered, Ting freeing herself from the inside. Howl. The sky saw Wolf let out a howl of fury, feeling incredibly angry at being trapped like that. Lin Mu could somewhat understand the beast's anguish and emotions. You wanna go at them again? Lin Mu asked. Growl. Ting replied with a nod, understanding Lin Mu's words. Are you sure Ting? Ming Aeolian asked. Bark. It'll be fine. She's not injured. We were just caught off guard. Lin Mu replied. But now we know what kind of people we are facing. He added. They are certainly strong. Was that a high grade immortal sword? Ming Dandan seemed to have sensed it by now. Yeah, even the shield is on the edge of turning into a high grade immortal shield. Lin Mu confirmed. To have that they are certainly not from a simple background. Hum, that crest on their robe seems familiar but I can't tell who they are, though I'm sure they are from the Deo Wind Empire. Ming Aeolian replied. Are you guys okay? Lu Su asked at that this time. They had been watching from over 2 kilometer away and hadn't gotten an update. Yeah, we're safe. But the opponent is stronger than I thought. Lin Mu replied. Do you need our help? Kian Wen asked. No it'll be fine. You two should focus on the others that might be approaching. The earlier explosion will have attracted the attention of plenty. Lin Mu replied. That's true. Lu Su replied. Though, do you know what power do those two immortals come from? Lin Mu said before describing their crest. I've seen that crest in the list of Deo Wind Empire's powers. Kian Wen was the one to speak this time. If I'm not wrong they should be from the Serene Glass Valley in the south of the Empire. He revealed. Serene Glass Valley? Ming Aeolian seemed to have remembered something. Oh wait. I know them. Aren't they the one who've made one of the peak grade immortals weapons of the Deo Wind Empire? She stated. Yes. They received a lot of recognition for it in the past. Though these days they have fallen a bit. Kian Wen replied. Hearing this, Lin Mu was surprised. So they are a clan that is involved in the forging of immortal weapons? Lin Mu asked. Not really. They aren't a clan either, but rather a collective power of several clans. They just so happened to have a weapon forger that managed to make a peak grade immortal weapon which he then gifted to the emperor. Kian Wen quickly explained. I see. Guess it makes sense why they have such strong weapons. Even their talismanic formations seem to be rather good. Lin Mu replied. Dragon Monarch System. Chapter 390-390, The Meeting, I. Aditya, I want to add one thing. What you would like to add? Aditya curiously asked. For decades now, my empire is in conflict with the Mystic Spring Empire on the control of the Anna Maria Islands. I was forced to settle with seven islands and the other seven islands were forcefully taken away by the Mystic Spring Empire. I won total control of the Anna Maria Islands. Daxton made his intentions clear. The Anna Maria Islands was a good location for the Echo Dominion Empire. Using the Anna Maria Islands, the Echo Dominion Empire would be able to launch an attack on the Mystic Spring Empire from the sea as well. Also, if the Anna Maria Islands are in Daxton's hands, then no one could use this location to block the foreign ships that come to his empire. Since we're talking about the Anna Maria Islands, there is something that I want to ask you. After touring around the entire island with Alicia, Aditya had some plans for this island. What is it? Daxton curiously asked. Adian also looked very curious. He also wanted to know what Aditya wanted. This is more like a request. Go on. I will try my best to fulfill your request. This war had shown Daxton the powers that the Eisterin Empire had. Being an ally of the Eisterin Empire would only bring his empire endless benefits and political powers. I want this island. Aditya knew that if Daxton fulfilled his request, then in the future he will owe him one. And Aditya was perfectly alright with that idea.
Can I ask you why? Daxton was curious. My fiancé likes this place. Not to mention, Aditya also likes this island. I don't mind. From this point onwards, this island will belong to the Eisterin Empire. The Echo Dominion Empire will have no claim on this island. Thank you. Daxton nodded his head. Dash. Dash. Scene change. In the living room, the members of the Oracle Alliance, the Eisterin Emperor, the Echo Dominion Emperor, and the Hephaestus Kingdom's King all were sitting on the couches and chairs. Ironically enough, this was the first time all eight major powers of the northwestern region had gathered for a meeting. And this happened because the Echo Nexus Empire had to mess with an empire from another region. It's my and my tribe's honor to have you all on this small island. First of all, I would like to apologize if this isn't up to your standard. Sam bowed his head to show his sincerity. Inside he was extremely nervous. If anything went wrong, this entire island could be destroyed within a few seconds. Each person sitting in this room had immense political and military powers under their command. Just being in their presence made Sam extremely nervous. Like I told you from the beginning. There is no need to apologize. We chose this location. If anything it is us who is burdening you and your tribe with our presence. Aditya was sitting in the middle. Elisha was sitting on his right and Spencer was on his left. If there is nothing else, then you can get out and let us start this meeting. In an annoyed tone, Lucas told the tribe leader to leave the room. Sam nodded his head and then left the room with two other ice elves who were there. From Lucas's tone, one can easily tell that the Echo Nexus Emperor is very annoyed and displeased. Unlike Aditya who is very relaxed and calm, Lucas looked impatient and looked like he couldn't wait for this meeting to end. After Sam left, Lucas directly looked at Aditya and asked. Tell me what you and your allies want. After all the things that Aditya did, Lucas hated Aditya more than anything else. He didn't want to sit in the same room as Aditya. Daxton and Aiden turned to Aditya. Neither of them spoke anything. This matter started between the Eisterin Empire and the Echo Nexus Empire. Both emperors were the major power holders in this war and hence had the right to speak while others listened. You sound very important, your majesty. And here I was thinking of having lunch with everyone. Unlike Lucas, Aditya was completely cool, calm, and collected. I don't have for such nonsense. Now tell me what do you want? Since you're being so impatient, then let my Prime Minister tell you what we want from the Oracle Alliance. Here it comes, Prime Minister Philip thoughts in his mind. He could only pray that the opponent doesn't demand too much. Aditya looked at Spencer and nodded his head. Spencer took out a golden scroll from his storage ring. Meanwhile, the members of the Oracle Alliance and Lucas himself were curious about the identity of the mysterious woman who was sitting next to Aditya. From the looks of it, Aditya was very close to this woman. So it was very possible that this woman was Aditya's wife. But as far as they knew Aditya was engaged to Duke Adam's daughter who is famously known as the Goddess of Alchemy. Even though they had questions, no one asked anything due to their pride. The Eisterin Empire and its allies will accept the surrender of the Oracle Alliance if only the Oracle Alliance agrees to do the following. 1. First of all, the Mystic Spring Empire will give the Anomaria Icelands to the Echo Dominion Empire. The Mystic Spring Empire or any member of the Oracle Alliance won't have any rights to conduct any military exercise around the Anomaria Icelands. If any soldiers or spies from the Mystic Spring Empire or any member of the Oracle Alliance are found near the Anomaria Islands then it will be seen as a threat to the Echo Dominion Empire and its allies. In case this was to happen, the Echo Dominion Empire and its allies will immediately take action against the Mystic Spring Empire. Hearing this, the Mystic Spring Empire easily agreed and had no problem with these conditions. Although the Anomaria Islands were valuable assets to the Mystic Spring Empire, Giving up the remaining seven islands was still acceptable in the Emperor's opinion. I agree. The Mystic Spring Emperor easily agreed. Next. 2. The Echo Nexus Empire will give ownership of the Obi Islands to the Eisterin Empire. The Echo Nexus Empire won't have any right to conduct any military exercise near the Obi Islands. If any soldiers or spies or anyone from the military of the Echo Nexus Empire or any member of the Oracle Alliance are found near the Obi Islands then it will be seen as a threat to the Eisterin Empire and its allies. In case this was to happen, 
The Eastern Empire and its allies will immediately take action against the Echo Nexus Empire. After Spencer ended his words, everyone's eyes were on Lucas. The Obi Islands weren't just small islands like the Anna Maria Islands. The Obi Islands were almost big as the mainland territory of the Queenstown Empire. Giving up the ownership of the Obi Islands would be a huge loss for the Echo Nexus Empire. The Obi Island is the largest island in the northwestern region. The Obi Islands are two islands. One big island and another very small island. The second island is slightly larger than Eldoria Island. Both islands are often considered one big island. As the distance between both islands is really small. One can go to the small Obi Island just by swimming. The Obi Islands are known for their stunning natural landscapes, unique culture, and delicious cuisine. The Obi Island is renowned for its breathtaking natural scenery. It is characterized by vast open spaces, rolling hills, and rugged mountains. The Obi Island experiences a cooler climate compared to the rest of the mainland. Winters are long and cold with heavy snowfall. The summers are milder and more comfortable and is a popular tourist attraction because of its pleasant temperatures and beautiful flower fields. The Obi Island is home to beautiful lavender fields. Lavender blooms from late June to early August, creating a stunning purple landscape that attracts many visitors. The Obi Island boasts a rich diversity of magic wildlife. There are magic brown bears, magic deer, magic foxes, and various magic bird species. The Obi Island is renowned for its hot springs, which are scattered throughout the island. These hot springs offer relaxation and rejuvenation, with mineral-rich waters believed to have healing properties. Obi Island is also home to the largest dwarf population in the Dying Isle continent. A major reason why the Echo Nexus Empire's military is so powerful has to do with the dwarfs that make high-quality weapons and armor for the Echo Nexus Empire. The Obi Islands have the second biggest gold mine. Most importantly, Obi Island also has an Ethereum mine. Throughout the entire Dying Isle continent, only the Echo Nexus Empire has Ethereum mine. Ethereum stone is 10 times more valuable than mana stones. The Echo Nexus Empire earns a large chunk of its money through selling Ethereum and gold mined from the Obi Islands. In short words, the Obi Islands were simply too valuable for the Echo Nexus Empire. The two islands were full of resources and treasures. Giving up the Obi Islands would mean that the Echo Nexus Empire's GDP was going to shrink by 23.5%. And this wasn't simply acceptable. Not to mention, if the Eastern Empire were to get the Obi Islands, then the Echo Nexus Empire will be surrounded from two sides. The Eastern Empire will be able to launch an attack on the Echo Nexus Empire from the northwest. And the Echo Nexus Empire already had the Echo Dominion Empire at its eastern borders. If in case another war breaks out, this time the Echo Nexus Empire will be attacked from two sides. Giving up the Obi Islands would be the same as letting an enemy live next to your house. Impossible. There is no way I am going to give up the Obi Islands. Lucas immediately refused. The Obi Islands were simply too valuable. You don't have any other choice. Meeting Aditya's cold red eyes, Lucas slightly shivered in fear. He felt frightened. He had no choice but to look away. What else do you want? Lucas asked. While keeping his eyes on Lucas, Aditya signaled Spencer to keep reading. 3. The Mathia Empire will give ownership of the Catalina Islands to the Hephaestus Kingdom. If any soldiers or spies from the Mathia Empire or any member of the Oracle Alliance are found near the Catalina Islands then it will be seen as a threat to the Hephaestus Kingdom and its allies. In case this was to happen, the Hephaestus Kingdom and its allies will immediately take action against the Mathia Empire. Adian and his Prime Minister were very surprised to hear this. After all, the Hephaestus Kingdom did not provide much help in this war. It was the Eisterin troops and Aditya who defended his kingdom and also won the war. If anything, his soldiers were more like a burden to everyone and were hindering their progress. For this, Adian feels very ashamed. Adian thought that he had made his intentions clear. In exchange for siding with the Eisterin Empire, he wanted Aditya's help in rebuilding his kingdom and getting rid of all waste. Through Aditya, he hoped to re-establish order within the entire kingdom. The Catalina Islands? The Mathia Emperor was surprised. Just like the Obi Islands are very important to the Echo Nexus Empire, 
the Catalina Islands were important to the Mathia Empire. The central part of the northwestern region was very hot and dry due to numerous factors. Since a big part of the Mathia Empire was in the center of the northwestern region, the Mathia Empire did not have much fertile land. Around 20 to 30 percent of the empire's food needs were fulfilled by the Catalina Islands which had rich fertile soil and very suitable condition for growing rice. Your Majesty, with all due respect, giving up the Catalina Islands would be the end of my empire. We would be struggling to make ends. The food prices are going to rise and millions of people are going to starve to death. Giving up the Catalina Islands isn't an option for me and for my people. Chapter 391-391, The Meeting, I, I, Your Majesty, with all due respect, giving up the Catalina Islands would be the end of my empire. We would be struggling to make ends. The food prices are going to rise and millions of people are going to starve to death. Giving up the Catalina Islands isn't an option for me and for my people. The Mathia Empire Jonathan sounded really righteous. Don't pretend as if you care about your people. If you really cared for your people, then you wouldn't have increased the tax rate in your empire. You have been squeezing money from the common class people. If you lower the tax rate, then your people would be able to afford food and other commodities. Hearing this Jonathan's face turned ugly. Whatever Aditya said just now was very true. In the whole continent, his empire had the highest tax rate. Every year millions of people were sold as slaves due to high taxes. And, anyway, I am not giving up the Catalina Islands. Jonathan also refused to give up his territory just like Lucas. Aditya's coldly looked at Jonathan for a moment. The cold stare was making Jonathan feel uneasy. He felt nervous and frightened. After all, the man in front of him had defeated the strongest fifth order cultivator. If this man wanted, he could end their lives within a few seconds and no one would be able to stop him. Spencer, continue reading. 4. The Oracle Alliance shall give 12 billion gold coins as compensation to the Eisterian Empire and its allies. Each Alliance member will have to pay 2 billion gold coins as compensation. The 12 billion gold can be paid in cash or in the form of assets. The money has to be paid within one week. Hearing this, all the other emperors looked at Lucas. This meant that each empire would have to pay 2 billion gold coins. Only the Echo Nexus Empire and the Mystic Spring Empire were rich enough to have billions of gold coins in cash. As for others, they didn't have that much money in cash. And if they wanted to raise this money, they would have to sell a lot of their valuable assets. 12 billion gold coins? Are you out of your mind? There is no way we can pay this much money within a week. P. Everyone turned their eyes at Alicia who had remained silent up to this moment. Eric Darkwood, if I remember correctly, then recently you spend 100 million gold coins building a gold statue of yourself that is over 70 meters tall height and you also have secretly bought 200 million worth of gold from the Echo Nexus Empire to build multiple gold statues of yourselves and your wife. Apart from the detire. No one really has seen the guild leader of the... Alicia went to meet Aditya because she was somewhat curious about her finance, who had suddenly changed. Alicia sent her subordinates to meet the emperors or kings of each empire or kingdom to discuss the conditions to open her guild's branch in their territories. This isn't true. Arik immediately refused. Arik Darkwood was the emperor of the Queenstown Empire. The Queenstown Empire is thought to be the poorest member of the alliance. But it turned out, Arik has been hiding his wealth. Hearing Alicia's words, others looked at Lucas and Arik in a mix of shock and surprise. Your Majesty, is that true? Rhys Gilliam, who is the number one bootlicker of Lucas asked in a shocked tone. Yes, it's true. Since the matter was out, there was no reason to hide it. But you said that in order to build that statue you had to take a big debt. You said something about fulfilling your dreams. Jonathan who was the emperor of the Mathia Empire asked. Jonathan considered Eric as a friend. Both of them often talked and spent time together. Eric did not reply. He instead lowered his head and kept quiet. That's not all. Last year, your empire earned a whopping 700 million million gold coins in profits just by selling starfire berries. Elisha smirked under her veil. Eric is that true? This time Lucas looked very shocked and shaken by this fact. 
Starfire berries are a special type of magic fruit that only grows in the vast manor islands which are under the control of Arik. The starfire berries are small, luminescent fruit that glows with a soft, celestial light. When consumed, it grants temporarily enhanced agility and night vision and also temporarily increases the cultivation speed of the cultivator. The starfire berries are highly valuable due to their demand. Almost every empire wants starfire berries. It takes an entire year for starfire berries to ripen. Given the benefits of the starfire berries, Lucas made a rule for Arik. Arik would have to sell all of the starfire berries to the members of the Oracle Alliance at a cheaper price. But last year, Arik told everyone that due to a lack of rain, there has been a decrease in the production of starfire berries. Lucas trusted Arik and didn't really look into this matter. Arik used this chance to sell large amounts of starfire berries outside and make a lot of profits. Your Majesty, this isn't true at all. This bitch is telling lies. This bitch shouldn't be here. This be. Lucas only saw the blur when the next second, Arik who had been sitting on his left was sent flying. Exclamation point. Everyone saw Detire standing. Arik was nowhere to be seen. Looking back, they all saw a large hole in the walls. Outside, the ice elves who were around the house were shocked to find the Queenstown Emperor lying in the snow 100 meters away. His face was completely disfigured. His nose was broken and bleeding. Several of his teeth were also broken. A detire's punch had also cracked his skull. His whole face was covered in blood. He was grunting like an animal that was about to die. Eister an emperor, why did you do that? Lucas stood up, looking completely angry. However, a detire did not back down. How dare that bastard disrespect my wife. Fierce crimson lightning flickered around a detire's body. His eyes turned red. His pupils turned into a vertical slit. Red scales began to grow over his skin. A detire was slowly transforming into his dragon form. Seeing all this, other emperors slowly backed down in fear. Even Alicia was stunned seeing a detire's anger. But deep down, she really felt warm. Dot. Dot. Hearing this Lucas instantly began to regret his outburst. The look in a detire's eyes told him that he and his allies were screwed. Even though he and his allies brought their strongest men with them, even if all of them joined hands to fight this monster, then also no one would be able to stop him. If things have come to this, then I have no choice but to use it, things had come to the point where only one party could live. And another party had to die. Eister an emperor, you leave me with no choice. A dark aura surrounded Lucas. The aura was very cold and sinister. Lucas's eyes turned black. His skin color turned black. The manner in his body began to change its nature. Uh, Lucas suddenly let out a loud painful scream. It was as if he was in great pain. No one could explain what was going on. Even a detire felt a big threat from this man. Get out of here, a detire told his allies to leave. Too late. A detire widened his eyes seeing Lucas turning into a completely different man. Two black horns had grown on his head. He had bat-like wings. His skin had turned completely black. At the same time, a detire felt Lucas's aura was rapidly getting stronger. I hope you liked my gift. A detire saw a black energy orb in front of him. Seeing this, a detire knew that something very bad was going to happen. Elisha suddenly found herself hugged by a detire. She also noticed a transparent layer of skin was covered her entire body. A detire was focusing entirely on protecting Alicia. Before she could understand what was going on, a huge explosion took place. Exclamation point. A huge explosion took shook the core of the island. Even the neighboring islands heard the sound of the explosion. The whole of Blackburn village was shaken by this explosion. The shockwave of the explosion destroyed all of the houses and seriously injured many ice elves. Some unfortunate. Ice elves had died along with some soldiers that a detire and others brought with them. It was because the soldiers were very close to the house. Ah. Elisha felt her whole body was in pain. But fortunately, no bones in her body were broken. Other than some minor burns, she was completely fine. But a detire wasn't fine at all. Opening her eyes, the first thing that she saw was his relieved face. Fortunately, you're alright. He said in a tired voice. 
He then closed his eyes and buried his face in her bosom. However, seeing him like this, Alicia panicked. Her hands felt something wet. She widened her eyes in shock seeing his blood in her hands. His back was severely injured. The explosion had burned his skin and exposed his flesh. A detire focused entirely on saving Alicia. With so little time on his hand, the first thing that he prioritized was saving the woman who had loved. Reborn as a Dragon, 266-268, by Simo. Chapter 266, The Past and the Present. For the past few weeks, my life has been a grand adventure of sorts. After Brita's visit, and our sudden reunion, we ended up spending our time exploring the so-called Forbidden Continent. We traveled together taking in the breathtaking landscapes of the continent, though we never really strayed too far from our floating mountain. The massive forest was our main destination, where we spent hours strolling amidst the towering trees, and the rays of the sun filtering through the foliage cast a verdant glow all around us. Occasionally, we would hunt games for sport. Something my goddess friend seemed to enjoy very much. As we wandered deeper into the forest, we encountered all manner of creatures some of which she had never seen before. Brita and I would often marvel at their unique traits and quirks, and I would regale her with stories of my previous experiences. With each passing day, our bond grew stronger, and I felt a sense of contentment that I had not known in a long time. In the evenings, we would retire home, to the floating mountain where I had created a cozy home for her by the edge of the land. Brita and I would spend hours talking about our experiences, and I would listen intently to her tales of the world from the past. On her end, she often asked me for more details of my adventures in the mortal planes. I happily obliged and described my feats. She often listened with a bemused expression on her face as we sat by the edge of the mountain staring at the stars that illuminated the night sky. I took the goddess around all the main parts where I usually spent my time before I decided to take her elsewhere. We stood atop a tall cliff gazing out at the endless expanse of the forbidden continent. The wind blew through my scales, carrying with it the faint scent of decay and death. It was the smell of the ancient battlefield, where Ammonita had taken his last stand against the gods. Beside me stood Brita, her expression contemplative as she took in the scene before her. I had debated whether or not to bring her to this place, to show her the remains of my great uncle, Ammonita. Although she tried to hide it, I could still tell that she was affected by the scene. Her eyes widened slightly as she took in the sight, and I could see the inner conflict in her expression. We made our way through the battlefield, stepping through the massive mountain-like swords that lay buried in the ground. As we walked, Brita remained quiet, lost in her thoughts. I could feel her sadness and pain radiating off of her, and I knew that this place brought back memories of a time long gone. It did not take us long before we arrived at the spot where Ammonita had fallen. His massive skeleton lay surrounded by the corpses of the dead gods. Brita's expression grew more complicated as she gazed at the sight. On one side, we were once enemies, but on another, things have changed, time changed everything. I cleared my throat and spoke, this is where Ammonita fell. It was here where I had to carry you, to seek his help when you were poisoned, I said. Brita nodded, her eyes still fixed on the scene before her. After a few seconds, she bowed her head in respect toward the deceased dragon. I could tell that this moment was weighing heavily on her, and so I used my manner to place a comforting hand on her shoulder. After a moment of silence, Brita finally spoke, truly, a meaningless war. I nodded lightly in agreement, the past is the past. The best we can do is to learn from it. The trip back home was spent in silence after that. Both of us, lost in our own thoughts. By the time we made it, we were greeted by the presence of my two cute siblings, both of whom were standing around the small hut I'd built with confused expressions as they whispered to each other. It does look like what the mortals call, a home, Sidus muttered as he lowered his head to scan the small cabin. Imi rolled her eyes and pushed him away with her tail before speaking. That's what I said, now move back, lest you accidentally knock the whole thing down. Sidus barred his teeth in annoyance and shot back, so what? Hanami was about to argue when they both suddenly turned their gazes toward me and Brita, as we slowly flew in the sky. My siblings exchanged confused looks and took a few steps back. 
I landed near the hut with a thud, while Brita gracefully landed by my side. Brother, Sidis was the first one to greet me. His expression, however, was full of confusion as he scanned Brita. Emmy's eyes on the other hand were shining in a rare light. Curiosity used out of her gaze as she struggled to form the words. Oh, it is good to see you both again. It's getting harder and harder to come across you guys, with how frequently you go out to train. I spoke with a smile. Both of my siblings lowered their heads lightly in respect. Ah, right. This here is Brita, daughter of Oris goddess of light, and Alta god of peace. And she is my friend, and guest, I said slowly and studied the expressions of my siblings. Sidis frowned but refrained from saying anything. His expression quickly turned awkward, as he nodded and turned toward me, I see. Well, I will be taking my leave first. Then, he lightly lowered his head and flew back to the cave. Well, that wasn't too bad, I inwardly thought and turned towards Ami who was still staring at Brita with fascination and curiosity. She quickly regained her composite, however, after Sidus took his leave. Pleasure to meet you, Brita. I am Ami. The goddess gave her a nod of confirmation, the pleasure is mine. Her tone was devoid of emotions, but it oddly reminded me of Ami for some reason. Both of them had a similar aura, of sorts. Well, let's sit down first, shall we? I said and conjured a small earth chair for the tiny goddess. She instead shook her head. Light particles danced around her body, illuminating it before she began to grow in size. My eyes widened in surprise as the once small goddess, barely tall enough to fit in my palm was now almost as tall as I was. You can do that? I asked in shock. Brita simply nodded. This is my original form, I thought you knew that already, she casually spoke. Huh, of course I didn't. And how come you never used it in the astral plane? Wait, why do you even bother shrinking yourself in the first place? My guess would be, for convenience, brother, Imi suddenly answered. Her eyes fixed on Brita as she spoke, would you mind if I asked you a few questions? 29. Chapter 267. Plans for the Future. My attention shifted back and forth between Brita and me, the two engrossed in their discussion, oblivious to my presence. As they talked, I couldn't help but listen in. I see, so that's how it was before, Imi nodded, her eyes focused on Brita. Brita replied, yes, but those days are long gone. Most of the deities are content to sit in the land of the gods now. They find the lack of responsibilities to be a good thing. I suppose I can understand that point of view, Imi said thoughtfully. I do enjoy sleeping a lot, but eventually, it would become tedious. Not being able to interact with the world? You underestimate the gods, Brita shook her head, and I perked up, interested in what she had to say. Our lifespan is similar to yours, dragons. While an eternity of doing nothing might seem like it would cause despair, that's only the case for mortal minds. They cannot fathom the idea of immortality. For us, it's different. Brita paused, glancing at us before continuing. Both of you are still young, and compared to most of the other gods, so am I you might be curious about certain things. Perhaps you want to travel. She looked at me when she said that, or maybe you want to do something else? She paused again, letting her words sink in before continuing. With time, however, most of your emotions will mellow down. That doesn't mean they will disappear, but you will become less likely to make decisions driven by your emotions. Few gods or dragons reach this stage, as it takes a very, very long time. Then there's the land of the gods itself, Brito added. It's vast, and although it might appear to be a floating continent, a more accurate description would be a floating world. With that being the case, most of the gods don't mind not being able to interact with the small mortal plane. As Brita finished speaking, Imi and I were both silent, pondering her words. It was the first time I had heard her speak so much in one sitting, and I found it both strange and refreshing. After a while, Imi was the first to break the silence, her voice echoing through the vast halls of the temple. I see, she said, her eyes flickering with curiosity. And by not being allowed to interact with the mortal plane, you mean? Imi asked, her tone questioning and intrigued. Exactly what it sounds like, Brita replied. We cannot step foot on the mortal plane, 
and we cannot exert our influence directly on the mortals. I shook my head in disappointment, muttering under my breath. That's rather disappointing. Brita glanced at me briefly before turning back to Emi. Has there been any deity that defied the order before? Emi asked. Not that I know of, Brita replied. Much like your council of elder dragons, we also have something similar. They are responsible for keeping order in the land of gods. Emi's eyes seemed to shine with understanding as she nodded. Interesting, she said. Suddenly, the goddess turned her gaze towards my little sister. What about you? She asked. Emi was taken aback, hesitating before she asked, Me? What about me? I already know what this fool wants to do, Brita said, pointing at me. Something about exploring the stars and the worlds beyond. Although if you ask me, he just cannot seem to be able to sit still in one place for long. So what about you? What are your plans? Exploration? Or perhaps joining the others in the front lines and raids? Faced with Brita's question, Imi fell silent thinking carefully before answering. Comma it didn't take long before she opened her mouth to speak. I would like to visit the mortal plane first, she said. From the memories in my inheritance, I was able to catch a glimpse of their way of life. Their politics and schemes, although meaningless in the face of absolute strength, are still very fascinating to me. I wasn't surprised by her answer, since young, Imi had always displayed curiosity in the matters of the mortals, so her explanation came as no surprise to me. The mortals are fragile. Unlike us, with our immortality and powers, they are weak. Brito answered slowly. I know, and that's exactly what makes them fascinating to me. They are weak, but they still struggle to climb higher, and they use all sorts of means to do so. Truly fascinating. Hum, I don't see the appeal, Brito replied flatly. A small chuckle escaped my mouth at that. Imi didn't seem to mind, however, and instead, she simply smiled. Well, if you are that much interested in the mortals, how about I'll let you go host the next tournament? The next tournament? Imi questioned. After a quick explanation, her eyes seemed to shine brightly as she constantly nodded. Are you sure, brother? You would allow me to go in your stead? She asked again in disbelief. Why not? Out of all the others, you are the most responsible one. I smiled. Her face lit up and joy at my compliment before she hesitantly asked but wouldn't it cause problems for you? Not at all. Besides, you can use the opportunity to interact with them and see all of those schemes and plots firsthand. I can? She couldn't help but ask again to which I nodded. After which... Imi lowered her head and gave me a deep respectful bow. Thank you, brother. I waved my tail dismissively, it's nothing. Brita watched our interaction with amusement evident in her gaze. And what will you be doing? She suddenly asked. I turned toward the now giant goddess and answered with shrug. I traveled the mortal plane, and saw what it held. Although I did not visit everything, I still plan to do so later on. For now, however. Your talk of the front lines and raids has piqued my curiosity, I raised my head to glance at the sky, I would like to see that for myself, as well. Brita frowned, you'll join the war on a whim? Who says it's a whim? I asked the smile not quite leaving my face. The goddess frown deepened, if this is because I said I would join. I snorted in response and rolled my eyes before speaking, you merely piqued my curiosity, Brita. The decision to join is mine after all. Besides, it was bound to happen sooner or later. And not to mention, I would like to see the fight of the dragons with my own eyes. Imi solemnly nodded by my side, while Brita sighed and remained silent. 24. Chapter 268, Before the Departure. Next. The upcoming days were filled with preparations for what was to come. I devoted my time to teaching Imi all she needed to know about the mortal lands, from the vast empires and intricate political systems to the rebels, demons, and elves that roamed the realm. Imi listened to my teachings with a passionate curiosity, eager to learn more, and often asked questions that even I couldn't answer. I also did not forget to inform her of my disciples and the church, assuring her that they would be of great help once she arrived. As we waited for the day of departure, Brita and I spend countless hours sparring and honing our skills. 
something that I surprisingly found much pleasure in. Imi, on the other hand, preferred to spend her time relaxing under the warm sun and taking much needed naps. Sidus, intrigued by our plan for the upcoming war and raids, often joined us in our sparring sessions. Though he would never admit it, I could sense that he was gradually warming up to Brita. After all, what better way to bond them by hurling spells and spears at each other? As the days passed, we continued with our routine until one day, my grandfather unexpectedly returned, disrupting the peaceful atmosphere that had enveloped us. My grandfather's voice boomed as he spoke, his towering figure casting a shadow over us. I could feel his piercing gaze scrutinizing me as he asked, So, finally grown your wings, and ready to join us, brat? I stood tall, determined not to show any signs of weakness. Yes, grandfather. I want to see the war you are all fighting. He then turned his attention to Sidus, who had a solemn expression on his face, and asked, What about you? Do you think you are ready to join? I am, grandfather, Sidus replied with equal determination. My grandfather's eyes then fell upon Brita, and he said, And you, you must be the little goddess, Brita, was it? Brita lowered her head in respect and replied, Yes, I am. Grandfather's face was inscrutable as he spoke. I do not know what has sparked this sudden interest in the war, and I do not care much to ask. But what I will tell you is this, if you do not take this seriously, then you will die. This is not an adventure like the one you had before. This is a brutal war. I opened my mouth to reply. I believe we are well aware but grandfather clicked his tongue in annoyance and cut me off. No, you are not aware of anything, brat. There is a reason why you hardly come across any dragons on this continent. Few could afford to come back. I felt a twinge of fear at my grandfather's words, but I refused to let it show. Brita's expression remained unreadable, while Sidus looked more determined than ever. Imi continued sleeping, seemingly unfazed by the conversation. Somehow, despite my grandfather's warning, I couldn't shake off the excitement that was building within me. After a few moments of oppressing silence, grandfather released a long sigh. So be it. You three cannot join the defense battlefield, you are too weak to survive there. So you will be sent to raid one of the lower shade realms. Wouldn't that be more dangerous? I couldn't help but ask. Grandfather's curt reply swiftly came, no. It's difficult for us to interact with certain realms directly due to the difference in powers. Think of it as a law of sorts. This also applies to the shades as well, which means all the ones you will come across there are on the same level as you. I see, I nodded in understanding. I'll make this brief, some of the realms might have natives that survived the shades initial corruption. Others do not. Usually. We would send our first force to determine whether or not the realm could be saved. If the first force team is able to dispatch the shades by themselves, then all is good. If not, and the realm is too far gone, then it will be destroyed. Understand? Uh, by destroyed you mean. Exactly what it sounds like. You should know what it means, you have experience almost ruining this plane, after all. About that. It was a mistake, I awkwardly answered. Who is in charge of destroying the realm? Brita suddenly asked. Grandfather paused for a second as he glanced at the goddess. If he still held any grudges against the gods, I didn't know for his expression was unfathomable as he responded. That will be the first force sent there. This means, you, he said, motioning with his head to us. Any more questions? He asked, and before I could think of anything he quickly continued, none? Good. We leave at dawn. You best prepare yourself. I still have some matters to take care of so I will pick you up tomorrow. Without giving us any time to react, Grandfather's massive figure shot into the sky causing the ground to shake as he launched himself and disappeared into the horizon. That was... Fast, I muttered. Brita frowned, if we destroy the realm, then what happens to us? She asked. I assume we will go back? I answered hesitantly. That's not how that works. Brita shook her head. An older dragon will be sent with us, to serve as our link, Sidus suddenly spoke causing me to turn toward him in surprise as he continued, he or she, won't be able to join us and descend to the realm, but they will stand guard outside. 
Should things turn bad, then it is them that will protect us from the fallout and gets us back home. Oh, and where did you hear that from? I asked, unable to disguise my curiosity. Siddha shrugged and replied, I asked father about the war when you were not here, brother. I raised my brow and spoke, I'm surprised he gave you a direct answer. He didn't. Siddha shook his head with a sigh, causing a small laugh to escape from my mouth. Well, you heard grandfather. We leave at dawn, if you still have anything to prepare, now is the time, I said while glancing at my two companions. Siddha simply shook his head, while Brita turned and walked away toward the edge of the mountain where her small cabin was situated. Her massive body slowly shrank in size as she walked away. Ha! Huh. What about you and me? I asked causing her to open her eyes and let out a yawn. You already told me everything I need to know, brother. Perhaps it would be wise for you to get some rest before you leave. Hum, I guess you're right. 2. End of block 1.